So the separated test, the leak off test, DFIT, those are to get SH min or S3, right? What about SH max? Well, if we go back to the Kirsch equations, and instead of saying that, you know, typically our delta P, uh, we have the mud weight here. P, if we substitute in, you know, typically we have the mud weight <coughs> for this term. But if we substitute for the mud weight, something we'll call PB, well, this is sort of the breakdown pressure, if you will. So it's sort of like the formation breakdown pressure, but in this case, we're talking about this is the pressure uh, that at the instant that a fracture propagates, a tensile fracture propagates from the wellbore, okay? And so if you plug that back into the Kirsch equations to the solution of the, uh, if you plug that into the Kirsch equations, uh, then you have, you, have, you know, ignoring tem temperature effects, then you have this equation, again, where you have this T0, that's the tensile strength of the rock. And so if you were to say, measure SH min in an extended leak off test. If you could identify the breakdown pressure, the instant at which a tensile fracture was to initiate, measure the pore pressure and you know the strength of the rock, then you might assume that you could infer SH max that way, right? Because everything on the right hand side would be known. And by the way, th there's also a way to eliminate the need to know T0 and that's by having two loading cycles. So if you were to say have pressure versus time, if, if you were to load up and then you see the pressure drop, you, you would identify this normally as PB, um, but if you, you were to load up again and then you see the pressure drop, this would be, say, the PB at T equals to zero, because if you've already fractured, so if you've already fractured the rock in the first loading cycle, then there is no tensile strength, right? So this is, the second loading cycle, this pressure drop is just when you're opening the fracture that's already existed. Right? So in this, in this case, if you can identify this PB, then you can assume T equals zero and the equation reduces this. So then you only need to know SH min, the pore pressure. If you can identify this guy, then you can, at least according to the equations, determine what SH max is. So in theory, you could get SH max that way. But does it really work? Well, let's just look at some equations here. If you were to consider a, a system compressibility, so we're talking about the total compressibility of the entire column of fluid in the well. If you rearrange that equation, solve for delta P like that, you know, what we're looking for, again, what we're looking for is PB, which is sort of, so we have pressure versus time. What we're looking for is the sort of when the, you know, this, this inflection point when the pressure were to drop because now there's a tensile fracture in the well. So an inflection point in the curve is a stationary value. That's like, that's when the, when the rate of change of pressure changes, right? When the, it's when the rate of change of pressure, I mean, technically, mathematically, it's you know, when it's a zero of the rate of change curve, right? If you take the, the derivative then and set it equal to zero, it'd be an inflection point there, right? So going back to our discrete equation, we can sort of approximate the rate of change by if we divide by delta t. divide by delta T, so then we have something like the change in pressure with respect to time. And then over here is some proportionality constant times the change in volume with respect to time. Okay. 
And that's what we have here. So the, the thing is, right, we're looking for identifying the critical point of the DPDT curve, right, which is equivalent to this. Well, this volume of the system is enormous. It's enormous, right? It's like the whole entire volume of all the fluid that's in the column drilling mud whatsoever, whatever. And what we're looking for uh, times a tiny change, like the change in volume with respect to time. Well, that change in volume with respect to time in terms of the tensile fracture initiating is tiny. It's minuscule, right? We have this entire column of fl fluid, and we're, and we're trying to then add, and then we're going to add to it the volume of a one millimeter crack, crack right? And that's the thing we need to know. Well, it's impossible. Right? It's impossible to know. So you can try. I mean, you can certainly see an inflection point in the curve. If you, if you do that test, th there'll be an inflection point in the curve. But the thing is there, you've already propagated. I mean, what you're seeing in the inflection point in the curve, the DPDT curve, by that time, you've had to have added a significant amount of volume for you to actually see it. And so by that point, you're, you're, you've propagated a long fracture away from the well. And in that case, the Kirsch equations solutions aren't valid. Remember, the solution of the Kirsch equations are for a, circle, for, for a circular hole, right? They're not for a circular hole with a long fracture in it. So the equations aren't valid. You've, you've missed that, you know, one millimeter fracture. You'll never see it. And so uh, you can't really, the answer is you, you can't really do this. It's just not practical. You know, probably in a laboratory you probably could, right? If, you know, if you had a small, you had a small sample, small hole, and you were monitoring the pressure, uh, you know, you, you, where you have small volumes of fluid, then you might be, in very sensitive instruments, you might be able to do it. But, you know, in the field where you have very large volumes, you're never going to be able to detect that minuscule change in volume, which is proportional to the change in pressure, is what you're looking for. So one last thing, and like I said, we're having a short lecture today. Um, it's rare, but occasionally 